In 2014, the radical Sunni militant group ISIS killed over 9,000 civilians. The vast majority of them were Muslim. But even this number is only a small fraction of the countless victims worldwide murdered in the face of Islamic terrorism. Understanding the stark anti-Western sentiment and violent behavior of Islamic extremists requires consideration of nearly a century of historical factors. In pulling apart the context and complexity, there emerges a leader whose legacy in the rise of radical Islam is riddled with paradox. Gamal Abdel Nasser became the second president of Egypt in 1956, four years after helping to lead a successful coup against the monarchy, effectively ending 70 years of British occupation in the country. Before Nasser's rise to political prominence, however, he first fought for Egypt in the 1948 Arab-Israeli War, known in Arabic as al nakba the catastrophe. As the name suggests, nations of the Arab League suffered a crippling defeat at the hands of the infant Israeli state. By the end of the nine-month-long war, as many as 20,000 Arab soldiers and civilians had been killed, a number more than triple that of the Israelis. Additional humiliation for members of the Arab League came with territorial losses. Israel seized nearly 60% of land that had been allocated for Palestine in the UN Partition Agreement of 1947, as well as Jerusalem, which had been designated to become an international city. To the Arab nations, the existence of Israel was the epitome of Western imperialism and over-involvement in the region, and for Nasser, a catalyst in his crusade to defy Western interference by establishing Arab unity. After the war, he wrote at the Arab world, one region, the same factors and circumstances, even the same forces, opposing them all. It was clear that imperialism was the most prominent of these forces. Even Israel itself was but one of the outcomes of imperialism. If it had not fallen under British mandate, Zionism could not have found the necessary support to realize the idea of a national home in Palestine. That idea would have remained a foolish vision without hope of realization. The imperialism alluded to by Nasser was rooted in the 1919 dissolution of the Ottoman Empire. Following defeat of the crippled state in the First World War, Western powers, chiefly France and the United Kingdom, acting with the authority of the League of Nations split the region into a series of territories called mandates with the stated goal of rendering administrative advice and assistance by a mandatory until such time as they are able to stand alone. The powers also declared that the wishes of these communities must be a principal consideration in the selection of the mandatory, a provision disregarded in the creation of the Israeli state 30 years later. Definitely, this um, uh, was a pattern of foreign rule. And um, this really left a gap among the population at large, right? There was this idea that a people should be self-governing. If you're talking about the mandate system, yes, in general, it created a lot of serious problems throughout the Middle East. The mandate system had been implemented when Nasser was just an infant, and by the early 1950s, Western imperialism had taken a new face. In the years following the Second World War, the Middle East became a key strategic region as the Cold War loomed ever more prominent. Both Western powers and the Soviets looked to the various Arab states for control and resources, and by the time Nasser took power in 1956, U.S.-Soviet tensions were high. Nasser played off of Cold War anxieties with a delicate balancing act, at once accepting aid from the United States to build the Aswan High Dam, and simultaneously purchasing Soviet military equipment from Czechoslovakia. President Eisenhower, frustrated with the Egyptian leader's nerve, withdrew funding for the Aswan Dam and, in 1956, 
Nasser responded by announcing his seizure of the Suez Canal from British military occupation. From Alexandria, Egypt, Movie Tone News brings you the latest incident to upset the chancelleries of the free world. President Nasser delivering his fiery speech telling of his nationalization of the Suez Canal. A seizure from private interests that the Egyptian says is his answer to the West for refusing to finance the Aswan Dam. Nasser's nationalization of the canal was met with military force by the armies of France, Britain, and Israel. But after condemnation by the international community, including disapproval voiced by President Eisenhower and Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, the three nations were forced to withdraw their troops, and Egypt for the first time had complete sovereignty over the canal. Nasser's firm stance in the Suez Crisis was integral in both his rise to complete power in Egypt, as well as shaping his public perception. Very soon after uh, the new regime, the military regime, asked the British to leave, and the British and the French then eventually, uh, the Suez Canal is nationalized, and then it leads to the war with Israel, and the British and the French also getting involved. Um, so that becomes uh, a source of popularity for, for Nasser, and that also shapes his future political career and his legacy, how people view him. Okay, this anti-Western, strong anti-Western stance. The West grew more and more to be seen as a bully by the Arab world, and Nasser's public image as a counter to its imperialist aims solidified his power, ushering in a new decade of Pan-Arabism in defiance of the Western world. Nasser laid out the goals of Pan-Arabism early in his political career. A movement for unity across the Middle East among all those with the common Arab ethnic identity. Nasser did not speak directly of a common religious identity, though his speeches often employed Muslim rhetoric. In his work, The Philosophy of the Revolution, he envisioned a regular political congress wherein the leaders of the Muslim states, their public men, their pioneers in every field of knowledge, their writers, their leading industrialists, merchants, and youth meet to draw in this universal Islamic parliament the main lines of policy for their countries and their cooperation together until they meet again. Nasser's most prominent act in the progression of Pan-Arabism was the establishment of the United Arab Republic with Syria. At the time, Western powers feared the implications of rising Arab sentiments, but their worries of political upheaval were, at the time, somewhat unfounded. The Union dissolved as few other Arab leaders would join for fear of Nasser's rising influence. Still, pan-Arab fervor was high, and with other mounting anti-Western influences throughout the Middle East, the scene was ripe for radical Islamist groups to emerge. One such group had existed in Egypt many years prior to Nasser taking power, the Muslim Brotherhood. After the fundamentalist group tried to take Nasser's life in 1954, he began mass arrests of Muslim brothers, further igniting Islamist fury. But Nasser's opposition to political Islamism stands in paradox to his own Arab nationalist, anti-Western movement. While Nasser himself was a secularist, his ideas transcended political thought and became intertwined with religious rhetoric. Nasser died in September 1970, as did his secular pan-Arab vision but his legacy as a powerful leader who was able to effectively stand in defiance of the West lives on to this day. He played a very important role in establishing Egypt as an independent state. In that sense, I would say that Nasser's legacy continues. Nasser's most remarkable quality was his ability to adapt to the changing social, political, and economic factors of his time. Nasser embodied balance, the balance between secularism and Islamic identity, between East and West through Cold War hostilities, between his visions of pan-Arab unity and pragmatism as a leader. This balance may be lacking in modern radicals, but the influence of anti-Western sentiment and the desire for a strong Middle Eastern political entity evident in such extreme groups as ISIS lives on in his legacy.